This week, we welcome David Chamberlain, Managing Director of CRA Strategic Communication Practice, to discuss security incidents, simple responses that make all the difference. In the leadership and communication section, financial targets don't motiva- motivate employees. Texas power outage flags need to revisit business continuity. Security job candidate background checks what you can and can't do. And more. Business Security Weekly starts now. This is Security Weekly for security professionals by security professionals. Broadcasting live from G-Unit Studios in Rhode Island, it's the show where we explore the business of security to improve the security of business. Your trusted source for actionable insights on leadership, communication, and innovation. Get ready for Business Security Week. Welcome to Business Security Weekly. This is episode number 207, recorded March 1st, 2021. I am your host, Matt Alderman, here in Colorado. Joining me from G-Unit Studios in Rhode Island is my first co-host, Mr. Paul Asadorian. Hey, Matt. It's good to be here. Happy Monday. Happy Monday. And joining us remotely on the lines today is uh, my second co-host, Mr. Jason Albuquerque. Hello there. Great to be here. I, I thought after last week's show, you were just going to always go into studio because it was so You know, I, I really wanted to, and then the kiddos came down with a little something, um, you know, and I didn't want to spread the wealth. So I figured I'd stay away from the studio and, and, and not bring any uh, any disease in. <laughs> I'm, I'm sure there's a few in studio that appreciate that, Paul mm-hmm. included. <laughs> <laughs> Do you want to stay in the loop on all things Security Weekly? Visit securityweekly.com forward slash subscribe to subscribe on your favorite podcast catcher or our YouTube channel. Sign up for our mailing list and join our Discord server. Also, do you have a specific guest or topic that you want us to cover on one of the shows? Submit your suggestions for guests by visiting securityweekly.com dot com forward slash guests and completing the form if you're interested in topics i just updated the new content plan for security weekly which tells you all the topics paul wants to see we will review those suggestions monthly and we'll reach out to you once reviewed our guest for this segment is david chamberlain he is the managing director of cra strategic communication practice with 20 years of global experience building and transforming teams for some of the world's leading brands david partners with leaders to strategically drive business results build trust and credibility strengthen relationships with stakeholders and successfully navigate and mitigate the critical issues affecting their organization He also helped found and lead Edelman's Global Data Security and Privacy Group, which helped organizations prepare for, respond to, and recover from cybersecurity incidents with hundreds of millions of victims. David, welcome to Business Security Weekly. Thanks for having me, guys. It's great to be here. The first thing we have to get out of the way is CRA. That is not Cyber Risk Alliance, which is the company we work for. First start, who is CRA? Because I don't want to confuse our audience. So CRA is Communication Research Associates, and it's a management consulting firm that works with a number of Fortune 500 or 100 companies. So we help organizations manage their most strategic relationships. So whether that's boards or C-suites or communications executives, we help them solve their problems, basically using about 100 years of research on how to best communicate in situations. And we're going to focus today on security incidents. And look... We have this assumption that ah, it's never going to happen to us. And, and so, you know, but I want to talk about some of the challenges with security incidents and some of the lack of preparation by some organizations to be prepared for security incidents. And then we're going to provide some guidance later on. Like, here are the things you should really prepare for just in case to be ready for it. But let's start with some of the, the challenges, some of the struggles around preparing for security incidents. Yeah, it's interesting. I've been doing this for a number of years. And if you if you look at the issues that people are having, and I built an audit tool about seven years ago that we've used with organizations, and it really comes down to areas around comms planning, testing and readiness, and communications integration within, within an organization. And so in all of those areas, you see major issues, whether that's not having a crisis plan, not having a crisis plan with cyber, you know, um, 
having pre-drafted statements? Is there an IT escalation path? You know, all of those types of things. Have you even done a simulation? Because we know that going through a simulation actually helps you respond better and deal with the situation at hand. Um, testing those protocols, you know, involving your audience tends to be, I think, IT and, and, and business folks, but, you know, how engaged are operations, legal, sales, marketing, if one of these types of things were to happen, most of them aren't. And so it's completely, it's like speaking a different language for a lot of people within an organization when they get hit. And, and these communication plans are just not limited to security incidents. I mean, it, we're going to talk about the the Texas power outage, right? Mm-hmm. right. That had major business continuity uh, ramifications for, for people in the state and out of the state. I mean, these communication plans are just there. It's not just security incidents. It could be any type of incident. Yeah. What I've done throughout my career is really helped corporations and organizations build crisis communications plans. So whether that's a workplace violence situation, whether that's a, a facility down or in, I'm in Dallas, Texas. So I know what it's like to go without power for a few days, <laughs> a couple of weeks ago. Um, all of those types of, you know, what we consider most likely and most um, detrimental to the organization, we, it's called the top right box. And so what we're really focused on there is what are those three to five situations that are most likely going to cause problems for your organization that you're going to have to respond to and that could do significant damage to your organization. And so you're right. It's not just cyber. It's things like power outages and and electricity outages and, and no heat and other things, no food delivery and gas in, in Texas. That shuts businesses down. And, and in most cases, I find that they aren't typically prepared. Yeah, yeah I, I couldn't it, agree more. I mean, one you know, one of the things that I, I have felt throughout my career that helped me kind of build my chops with, with incident response and from a cyber perspective is I was in the public sector. So I was heavily right. involved with um, emergency management type activities, right? So um, in, in that phase of my career, I had to interface with the Rhode Island EMA and really learn their incident command system. And that right. gave me a wealth of knowledge on how to respond to incidents, again, outside of technology, right, which could be events that are, uh, you know, driven out of uh, natural disaster, events from the grid, um, you know, any type of, of uh, you know, attack that may happen from, from the human perspective, right? Um, so, you know, shooter type engagements and that type yep. of thing. But that gave me such a wealth of knowledge on how to build the structure and framework around incident response that, you know, uh, throughout my career, I, I didn't reinvent the wheel. I took that knowledge and it helped build my incident response program. Yeah, no, definitely. I mean, what you find is, and I want to be careful when I say this, it's not all companies. Regulated industries, uh, I used to be the chief communications officer at PNC, uh, the fifth largest bank in the U.S., yeah they're going through regular simulations once or twice a year. They're breaking things down. They've got their plans. They're exercising them. You know, that's a big deal. But in those non-regulated areas, to your point, you know, it it makes a big difference. And and I think what people don't know just in the cyberspace alone and IBM and the Poneman Institute just put these numbers out. But if you've got that incident response preparedness plan and you have your team determined, that savings alone is roughly $2 million in an incident. And it's the largest cost saver for businesses going in incident response. And while that doesn't necessarily play out to other crisis incidents, um, because I couldn't tell you what those dollar amounts would be in terms of savings, that's a lot of money that people are leaving on the table. Yeah, definitely. Uh, Do we have uh, an issue with, I don't need to do this because I have cyber insurance. How does cyber insurance play into this? How do I handle a security incident? Does, does it only cloudy kind of the, the the challenges around this a bit? Because people are like, I, I've got cyber insurance and, you know, it's going to be handled by my policy. Yeah, cyber, cyber insurance is an interesting beast because I, I do think that that the people that have it kind of look at things that way, Matt. But I also know from my own experience working with organizations that have been hit that cybersecurity policies don't cover any, everything. And there's a lot of questions as to what they will and won't cover and up to how much. 
and and whose fault was it? Was it yours because there was human error or other things? So there are a lot of in and outs regarding cyber policies, and I'm not an insurance expert, but just having been in hundreds of these types of incidents, you see a lot of things pop up that a lot of people take for granted that they're going to be covered or, hey, I don't really have to prepare because all of this will yeah. you know, be paid for. What they don't realize is that 85% of people that go through a cybersecurity incident as a customer talk about their negative experience. And 33, 34% use social media to complain about their experience. So Cyber insurance doesn't do anything about that. You know, 83% of consumers in the U.S., according to some research, say that they'll stop spending at a business for several months immediately after a breach. That's not covered by cyber insurance. There's nothing about brand recovery in cyber insurance. So there are a number of things, or even in the prep, that if I were a cyber insurer, I'd be, and I were insuring someone, I'd be making sure that there were a certain number of things that were actually done by the company before they were eligible for the cyber insurance. Yeah, I think you bring yeah, up no, that, that, That's a great point. I mean, you know, the relationships I have with, with those cyber insurance companies, you know, once, once you contact them, the first thing they do is they assign a fiduciary, which is typically an attorney, right? And, yep. and from there, the clock is ticking. And if you're not prepared and you don't have all of your ducks in the row, your people, your process, you know, all of your communication strategies, ultimately you're going to end up paying for it because they're going to bring in a third party to get it done for you. And, you know, the more that you can present to the insurance companies and present to this fiduciary that you do have your ducks in a row, number one, the less out of scope cost you're going to have for that incident, right? Because you're not right. going to have to pay a professional to actually come in and, and do it for you. But you're also going to be viewed better in the lens of the insurance agency, right? Um, as you come out of this. So, so there's, there's benefit there from really two sides of the aisle, the short-term spend for the incident, but then that long-term spend that you may have from an insurance perspective. David, having, yeah, having said all that, I mean, is there value to having cyber insurance? Like what's the value? So I'm working with a number of companies right now and you know, my expenses, the law firm's expenses, the forensic firm's expenses are all being covered by that. Mm -hmm. um, so it helps a little with the expenses, in other words. Yeah, so yeah, you're looking at the average cost of a data breach or ransomware attack right now is running around 8.64 million. So there's a lot of costs that they potentially take off your plate. Mm -hmm. um, so it, it's helpful, I'm not saying it's not, it's just it's not the magic bullet. It doesn't help restore customer confidence or make up for any losses in customer confidence. Exactly. And that's why preparation on the front end is so important because there are certain things, you know, that you need to get done. One of the biggest wastes of time, and you didn't ask, but I'll just go here. One of the biggest wastes of time that I deal with in terms of being able to respond to an incident for a company is they haven't chosen their outside cyber law firm. They haven't chosen their forensics team. They haven't cho chosen their communications team. So imagine trying to do three or four engagement letters and, and scopes of work and other things and coming to agreement on, on time and hours and then cyber insurers will only pay certain dollar amounts per hour. That takes days. Mm -hmm. So at the very beginning of your response, if you don't even have that done, you're already days behind. Yeah. So that's what I want to talk about. Like, what are the simple steps organizations should do to prepare before they have a security incident? Now, you named a couple of them, but I'm sure there's a few more that we have to think about before we go out and choose our forensics firm, our law firm, and our communications firm. No, there are. I, I mean, first and foremost, and this comes down to um, any crisis plan, right? Who, who's the internal and the external team that you're going to use? So I mentioned the external, but on the internal, who, who are those experts going to be? Who from legal is going to be part of that? Who from communications? Who from IT? Where, where you run into problems is when that isn't identified or you run into a situation where everybody decides they want to be part of it and suddenly you end up with 25 people <laughs> on a call. And I've been on those calls and they're painful because you start... Oh, yeah to edit press releases with 25 people. So, you know, that type of thing, having, you know, most people don't think about this, but do they have a baseline for corporate reputation with their key stakeholders? And in a breach I worked with, with a major online auction site a few years ago, that was really critical because we were able to see 
not only where our, our corporate reputation or their corporate reputation was, but we were able to go out and survey them after the incident and see what was most important in terms of the response from the company. So asking those types of things and having that baseline was key. You know, having that communications chain of command where they're for multiple scenarios. So we mentioned earlier kind of cyber and, and then workplace violence, power outages, those types of things, making sure that you have those. This will sound scary, um, but meeting your state legislators, regulators, and policymakers beforehand, do you know them? You should know them. The first place you, you know, the first time you meet them, you don't want that to be when the attorney general is coming after you. Um, I've been on those calls. They're not pleasant. I've been on calls with up to 43 attorney generals meeting people for the first time. Now, I'm not saying go meet all 50 attorney generals, but, you know, who are those who are those policymakers and regulators that you want to have a relationship with beforehand so that they know you they know you're trustworthy they know you're you know who you are you know and david be, before we go any further I, you yeah. know that's usually like your legal team when you think about the internal stakeholders mm-hmm. 25 is too many but right. is there like an optimal size and and the optimal kind of roles that need to be on that team legal obviously has to be one but right but are is it you know is it five six people which roles do they play is there kind of an optimal yeah. internal team structure so you should always have your chief communications officer through your head of communications you're always going to want to have hr especially if it involves yeah. employees because you're going to have to deal with them you always want your general counsel the question then becomes does your ceo need to get engaged or do they just need to be updated and then it comes down to who are those folks that you need, also need to have. In most cases where you've got customers in a B2B situation, the head of customer service and the heads of lines of business are going to be critical. If you have a call center, you know, you're know you not going to pull them in right away, but you will end up pulling them in uh, because they're going to have to help deal with all those calls. Um, so I, I try to counsel folks to have it you know, no more than five to seven, closer to five if at all possible, so that you aren't just, you know, bogging down and what's going on. Yeah, no, hundred percent right. agreed. And, and, and to be honest with you, you had mentioned it earlier, having a chain of command for the communication side, but I think it's important to have a chain of command for the overall incident response, right? Mm-hmm. Who's quarterbacking yeah. the entire show. And then what's that approval process um, for things to get approved, whether it be communication, right? So you need your PR or marketing firm, whoever's running your communications team, expenditures, your CFO, right? There needs to be an approval process for all of these different activities that are going to happen throughout the incident response. Right. And in these types of incidents, what I typically see is the GC. And so the GC is kind of playing that role and interfacing back to the CEO and others. That doesn't mean the CEO isn't on on the calls or other things, Mm -hmm. but the GC is really taking care of all of those types of things and making sure that contracts are being approved, that the forensics are being impro- approved, those types of things are all happening. So in my experience, that's the key person that's usually responsible for those types of things. Yeah, no, that makes sense. And basically, it's the equivalent to the fiduciary, that attorney on the you know on the uh, cyber insurance side, right? It's that counterpart. Exactly. But the other thing that the general counsel and the CEO, and, and honestly, if I were on a board and I've been on boards of organizations, one of the things that I would be really looking at is, have we conducted that mock crisis simulation? I can tell you probably within the first five to 10 minutes of working with a firm, usually five, whether or not they've actually gone through a simulated cybersecurity incident. Because there's a familiarity with terms, there's a familiarity Mm -hmm. with language, there's a familiarity with each other. And so that's, that's huge. Um, because they just are able to respond better. It usually means that, hey, they may have thought already about how have we segmented our customers and created a hierarchy of them Mm -hmm. as to who will get white glove outreach and who won't, who's going to get the email notice. You know, they've probably already created an an escalation path in terms of reactive frontline, secondary, you know, Mm -hmm. and then who, who are those key folks that when it comes to, incidents and compromise and and your forensics report, when those questions come up from customers, that's where those go. So thinking all of those types of things through ahead of time is huge. And then even 
thinking through all the materials that you're going to need just from a communications perspective, you know, making sure that you've got that run of play. What's your holding statement? What's your ultimate statement? You know, do you have your voicemail scripts, your Q's and A's, Mm -hmm. you know, have you segmented out your communications so that whoever's talking with their group has a limited amount of information that fits their customers or their partners or their, or, or others. So all of those types of things you're going to end up dealing with. And if you have frontline employees, have you actually thought through, and this is where I spend a lot of time, training hundreds of employees at a time in in cyber um, or in uh, Zoom and Teams calls in, in the last year, but really walking them through training as to what to say, how to handle questions, you know, all those types of things, letting them role play, you know, 24 mm-hmm. hours before we have to go live. So that they understand how to do it. But most companies haven't done those types of simulations or taken those things into account ahead of time. Yeah. And they, I mean, there's only one way to do it, right? It's to practice, practice, practice. Uh, exactly. ultimately, ultimately, I equate it to muscle memory, right? It's very obvious if you don't have the muscle memory when you get into that incident response scenario. Yeah. It's just like shooting free throws, right? All of us probably played basketball. <laughs> I know I did or baseball or whatever the sport you practice and, and you sit on the line or you sit in the batter's box and you take your swings or you take your free throws and you, you, you practice them. And honestly, I think that companies, if they would just take the time, uh, you know, it's not a huge lift. You can have someone build a simulation pretty easily that two or four hours every six months or, or once a year is a tremendous help to organizations as they deal with these things. I had a, I've talked about this story briefly uh, on the podcast before I had a really good friend, CEO of a company that had an incident. They got a business email compromise and ended up wiring money to some other country that wasn't supposed to happen. And they didn't have a plan in place. So he calls me up because I'm in the industry. And I think, you know, it's tough because you're in the middle of the crisis. It's like, what do I do? Right. And one of the big challenges for him at the time was, I, I, they didn't have legal representation or counsel. They didn't know who to go to for guidance even, right? Any recommendations on some of those external relationships, if you don't have your own general counsel or if you're in an incident, like how do you identify who can help you? Because who who knows which forensics company, which law firms specialize in cybersecurity incidents that you might want to have a relationship before the incident actually happens. Yeah, and having that relationship beforehand is is tremendously helpful because of the time I mentioned that it saves. Um, you know, if you're a small business, and I'm watching a small business right now that's affecting one of my current clients, and they're probably going to go under because they don't have a general counsel and they haven't done any of this stuff because they just didn't have the time or the money. You know, what I found working with small businesses throughout my career is that they tend to go to their accountants, and the the believe it or not, accountants tend to be a clearinghouse of great information for small business owners. That's that's where they look for tech. It's where they look for legal help. They look for a number of things there. If I'm in a if I'm in a large organization with a general counsel, talking with other general counsels, or if I'm a CEO and asking for those types of things from my general counsel, or talking to other CEOs I know and networking, hey, who have you had a good experience with? What were some of the pitfalls? What were some of the other things? You know, honestly. I get numerous calls. I'll recommend a couple law firms. Uh, Actually, I always recommend two. I always get asked for three. Um, I can recommend forensics firms and and we do a lot of that. And, and the folks that are in the space, whether it's the law firms, the forensics firms or or the communications firms all kind of know each other. And there's a, you know, who's good and who's not. And it's very apparent just based on the way they talk and the language they use and talking about the situations that they've dealt with. So if I'm a CEO in a, in a small business or, or owner of a small business, I'm probably going to reach out to my accountant first. And if I'm in a larger business, I'm going to ask my general counsel, hey, who have other general counsels talked to? Um, or does my PR firm have any recommendations on those types of things? You'd be surprised how many actually do. Luckily, I did for him. And he got through the incident pretty much without too many issues. They got, they did recover the wire transfer and the money because they acted very quickly because wire transfers have a certain right. day to settlement. So, so it actually worked out very, very well for him at the end of the day, but I would not want to be a small business <laughs> that doesn't ha- happen to have a relationship with somebody that could point them mm. there quickly to, to, you know, to actually yeah. resolve the incident before a, a time window expired, for example. 
Yeah, most definitely. And but you also see with these larger organizations, I mean, I'm just going to be really candid. There isn't an excuse for them not having this stuff done ahead of time. It, it, it yes, it takes time. Yes, it takes effort. But getting it done and the savings and the help that it provides you is, to me, I I, I just don't understand it. I I, I wear a seatbelt. I have insurance. So, I you know I I. I'm also an Eagle Scout, so maybe I'm just weird that way. <laughs> but but for me, if I if I'm a CEO looking at the cost savings that potentially and and, and how comfortable my team is having to deal with that situation, I, I want to get that done because it puts them in the best position to succeed. And that's ultimately what a leader is supposed to do in an organization is put their team in the best position to succeed. Yeah, I, I honestly feel like the the pressure on security leaders, um, you know, coming from the top where we're being looked at as that just, you know, insurance of an organization and in, in, in tactical, I think we need to do a better job of educating upstream. That's, that's the key because when you do have the support of the CEO, when you do have the support of the board of directors and you're having those intelligent risk-based conversations with them, it opens their eyes to see investment needs to be made and time needs to be given to these teams to perform these tasks. Because remember, when you're bringing an incident response team together, you need to make sure that you have buy-in from HR, from finance, mm-hmm. from all these other business units that you don't directly have influence over, right? So ultimately, you need the leadership, the highest levels of leadership of your company to support that financial and or time investment you need to put in. So educating upstream is extremely important. Yeah, and I think educating downstream too and, and, sure, and horizontally sure. is important, right? Because it, having been in so many of these situations, you can't just put it all on the CISO. Right. The difficulty becomes, you know, most general counsels are not cybersecurity experts. That's mm-hmm. fine. They're they're paid to be, uh, you know, good at a number of different number of different areas and they all have their specialties, but most of them aren't cybersecurity. Corporate communications people aren't necessarily cybersecurity or, in some cases, even crisis experts, but they may be communications experts. So there's a shared responsibility across the board for communications, legal, HR, CISOs, CEOs, that everybody needs to play their role. And, um, you, you know, and in many cases, the reason I get brought in is, and my team get brought in, is, is because they're looking for someone they can just outsource it to that they know has done hundreds of incidents and reps and that they know that their their communications team hasn't. So it's better in many cases for them to bring in somebody um, like me and my team because it allows their communications team or other functions to kind of continue business as usual while this gets handled over the side. It doesn't mean they don't ultimately get brought in, but I've seen that become a a model in the last year that's been pretty interesting to, to watch because there isn't much of that cybersecurity knowledge in the in the communications world. Yeah, and and look, communications changed in in the era of COVID too. So you know, if you haven't done a mock scenario in a remote environment, it's probably a good idea to test it because think about all the communications when when you were together. They're different now. I, I mean, so any organization that hasn't done a mock scenario under the remote situation we're in could also be a, a little behind or, or a little out of practice just because the communication mechanisms have changed for us. Yeah, they definitely have. And, and the other thing is, quite honestly, to your point, Matt, one of the things that's really interesting is, and you guys will understand this, you never go through one of those simulations perfectly. You always find something that's wrong, something that you could have done better, something that you mm-hmm. wish you had that you didn't, somebody that didn't perform well, et cetera. The difficulty of doing this over Zoom and Teams and, and IM and text and phone, the difficulty that you're going to end up hearing a lot about there is, oh my gosh, how much of that is discoverable? Because your outside counsel and your general counsel are going to be a little concerned about how much communication is suddenly, you know, in written form, even more so than it may have been before. Mm-hmm. Interesting. Yeah. In turn, becoming a business record, right? Absolutely. Yep. Yeah. And hey, any any prosecutor is going to want to going to want that info. E discovery all day long. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Oh, so I, I took two two tips away and, and one caution. Prepare and practice and watch what you write down. <laughs> <laughs> yes. The more that you can keep to voice, the better. 
<laughs> awesome. Great and and be nice to your CISO. They've got a really tough job. Mm. They That's do, sure. actually. Amen. Amen. David, thank you so much for joining us on Business Security Weekly. Thanks so much for having me, guys. It's been a pleasure. Thanks, David. We're going to take a Thanks. We're going to take a quick break and then cover the leadership and communications articles for this week.